Good morning to all of you. Title my talk, Tongue in Cheek, is Guru Kula to Shishya Kula. I'll explain the uh, title in a minute. It's really about meeting the explosive demand for higher education. We have, um, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about the House of Education. I'm going to talk about India-centric concerns in the challenge in education the national mission, the NPTEL project, some design issues which are related to India-centric concerns, then delivery and deployment issues, and talk a little bit about the virtual university and what's called MOOC these days. The House of Education, in start off, is based on a metaphor from science, but first let me back up and tell you what uh, the great chemist Lewis said in a preface to his book in thermodynamics. He said the following, I'll paraphrase what he said. He said, uh, you've all been to ancient cathedrals, some of which are so beautiful that you are overawed by the beauty and the completeness. So he said, uh, if you went there when the construction was going on, are actually the result of ordinary human effort, given a direction and purpose by an extraordinary vision. So the whole idea is if you have a vision, then you can carry it forward with ordinary human effort. Of course, ordinary is an understatement. A lot of the effort has to be by talented people. But in any case, the house of education, if I may borrow a metaphor about science from the great physicist Robert Oppenheimer, is actually like an ancient monument in many ways. It's also different from a monument. First, let me say that it is like the ancient monument. It's vast, the monuments that you appreciate. It's vast and it's perfect in places where it's been completed. If, uh, the, the House of Education is also different because it has all, it has no pre-designed plan. Now, it's built with a randomness that suggests unending growth and improvisation. It's just remarkably beautiful. At the same time, it's very confusing to the novice. The, what happens when you enter the house of education is that you have a guide in the teacher. They take you through rooms which are all completed, beautifully done, aesthetically beautiful, and the teacher explains the design and the construction of these rooms. And if you've seen about 12 rooms and you understand their design, then you graduate and go on to college. Of course, I'm saying it somewhat cynically because you have all kinds of examinations and hurdles in between. But nevertheless, after that you go on to undergraduate education, you still have partly finished rooms and you still need a guide. You're taken through these rooms and you, again people explain things to you, some doubts, some places. And then you go on to graduate school or research. Some of you will go on. And then you will come back and build the scaffolding in some places. You may actually be so creative that you design a whole new wing in the house of education and so on. Let me confess something here. What we as teachers understand very well, we teach undergraduates. What we understand partially, we teach master's students. <laughs> what we don't understand at all, we teach PhD students. <laughs> so, so education also has no locks, no shut doors. Everybody is welcome. There are signs of welcome everywhere. But that's utopian description of the house of education. In actual practice, there are geographical, there are social, and there are economic considerations for admission to, a, how, to the house of education. So the big challenge, global challenge in education today is access, quality, and equity. This is true in India, it's true in the US too. There are slight differences. In the US, it's primarily education, it's primarily the fact that education has become very expensive and therefore not affordable for the poor. In India, we don't even have enough seats for the number of applicants. So let me explain some India-centric concerns in this context. The global challenge is also our challenge. The first problem is the gross enrollment ratio, which is the ratio of the number of people who enroll to the number of people who are eligible to enroll. If you look at this ratio, of, in India, it's about 19%. The world average is 30. That's shameful. And if you look at China, it's about 30. US is about 85, and Japan and UK are about 60. So you're talking of 
a gross enrollment ratio that's grossly inadequate and uh, it's a fact it's it's a well known statement that a ger of 30% is required for sustained economic growth that means if you want to grow economically you need an educated workforce of at least 30% ger second is the explosive demand it's you have actually seats going up from 300000 in uh, 2003 to almost 130 or 140000 in 2012 this kind of growth nobody has ever seen I mean, most other countries, the number of seats is the number of increase in seats that we need in India. So it's not, it's it's not something that we can wish away. And over a million seats, about ten hundred thousand reasonable ones. So only ten percent are reasonable seats. The calculation shows that you need a brick and mortar university every week. So just not possible. The student faculty ratio is hundred is to one. So really, the concern of the West is about icing on the cake of education. Ours is, the concern is about the cake itself. <laughs> Secondly, more India-centric concerns, we've been bragging about our demographic dividend. We have the largest number of young people. By 2035, we'll have the largest fraction of young people in India. But that's a double-edged sword. If you don't empower them with education, they can become restive and you can have a problem on your hands. So it's important that we educate them, give them an access to education. Second is emphasis in employment is moving from degree to competence. I mean, more of, many of you know, you talk to your seniors that their education has no relevance to what they're doing. This is actually more true in developing countries than in developed countries. In developed countries, they're looking for competence of a specific kind. They know what they want. Therefore, incidentally, my own opinion is education is not really related to empo employment. Education is actually refinement of the mind. I go around saying it's about learning to live gracefully with ignorance. I should say partial knowledge, but <laughs> ignorance is sort of more effective. We are essentially going in India, see, so you need, when the emphasis shifts from degree to competence, you need a series of certificate courses that would train you along a thread of competence. If you have already taken a job and you don't know the uh, theory behind your job, you can take a series of courses that would be very relevant to your job. And we are really in India going from Gurukula, which means in the house of the Guru, education in the house of the Guru, to Sishyakula, in the house of the student, with Gurus distributed over the world wide web. <laughs> now, this, this is nice, all right, but socially, we must realize that this is a change that we have to get used to. Not only don't teachers get uh, salaries, high salaries, they also don't get respect these days. So you have to find out who will come for that profession. So we had a workshop, all these considerations, we had a workshop in 1999. Uh, the Carnegie Mellon University played an important role in this. They had started virtual universities in Mexico with similar under similar conditions. And uh, the IITs and IIMs are involved. So we decided it has to be a participative process. So you have to involve the government in the beginning, you have to involve the industry, and of course the academia. And uh, we made the following observations. First, technology required for massive online education is already available and will only improve. We've already seen that you need one brick and mortar university every week and that's not possible. So per unit cost, communications and bandwidth and com communications bandwidth and computing power are already high and will continue to increase. Technology enhanced learning can be experiential. The word experiential comes from Montessori. I don't know if you've read The Absorbent Mind. I would recommend you read it. Maria Montessori was one of the greatest education researchers and she's, essentially she said children learn to play and learn from it faster than if you lecture to them. And she said, she suspected that was true of undergraduate students too. <laughs> but anyway, then non-linear, it's also non-linear goal oriented like Montessori 100 years ago. And it has the potential to deliver exciting improvements in quality. So the we proposed, made a proposal for a national program on technology enhanced learning. We felt that was a social component in IITs that was missing. We needed to do this in the country. So all of us got together. It was funded in two phases, in 2003 and 2008. The important things were, it has to be curriculum-based open courseware. MIT started at the same time. They had this courseware called open courseware. Many of you may have seen it. But it's not done, it's done beautifully. The individual videos are beautiful, the courses are good, the lectures are good, but they are not done to a disciplined syllabus. What we said was that we'll put together a curriculum-based courseware for engineering and science. 
I mean, the general statement is IIT profs will come and lecture and go and then you will fail in the exam. So, <laughs> the students said, they say it very cynically. So, the IIT profs decided that we will put together a curriculum and do the syllabus according to the university syllabus so that if you read, you won't actually fail in the examination. So, there are two phases 325 subject matter experts were involved in the first phase, in the second, about 2000. My job was really to keep the peace between them because you see, <laughs> faculty don't have salaries, they only have egos and you have to be careful with egos and you must realize that many of these people are very committed and very passionate about how a course should be taught. So when they fight, it's not because they're petty, just that they're very particular about how a course should be taught. So we took nine months fighting over how courses should be taught, what courses should be taught by whom, but after that it was all peaceful in two years, the first phase was completed. So our national mission, you must know that there is a mission called NMEICT. It's about the national mission on education using ICT. It's one of the visionary projects of the ministry. We always blame the ministry for various things, but they also do good things. So this mission actually wants to leverage ICT to take knowledge resources to the doorsteps of the learner. And then you develop open courses. NPTEL has now been absorbed into this mission. You create virtual classes, testing services, empower teachers and provide connectivity and access devices. So let me talk a little bit about design issues of NPTEL. The target audience for NPTEL had to be students, it had to be faculty, it also had to be professionals because you need continuing education. One of my predecessors used to say, used to apologize to computer science graduates saying, sorry guys, what we taught you is obsolete already at the time of graduation. So, I mean, the field progresses so fast that it's becoming difficult. So, you need <laughs> continuing education. So, about 20 teams of about six subject matter experts each arrive at the national curriculum for every program. The syllabus is based on major universities and we put them together, we broke it up into modules so that about seven modules will satisfy any one university syllabus. But there are actually eight to ten modules in each. And all the courses in have to be delivered. If you choose civil engineering, you have to deliver all the courses that belong to that discipline. Similarly, video is valuable for rural students. In fact, when we started, we wanted to do only web. And it was the minister for HRD who said, no, no, rural students like to see the face of a teacher. So please put in video. And he also created a channel called the Ekalavya channel. And he said, we'll put it up on that. Because he said Ekalavya was the first distance education student in mythology. <laughs> And for our part, we promised not to ask for the thumb. <laughs> anyway, we also conducted training workshops for thousands of faculty. We've been conducting them. Awareness workshop for students. We go talk to people in the various colleges. Created a social network site to facilitate online interactions. That's picking up in India. Then value addition, you have to have wiki type of information, animations, and quizzes, etc and case studies from the industry have not yet been added. All contents are posted on the web are, and they are all peer and user reviewed. This is NPTELS. It's now the largest open courseware collection in higher technical education today. And, uh, it's a, so delivery in many forms, you can look it up on the website also. The, okay. uh, the we have uh, multiple formats, FLV, MP4 and 3GP for mobile. It'd be, you'd be surprised the number of emails I've received from students saying, I travel one hour by train every day to college and because of your mobile downloads, I can now read the lectures on the mobile. That's very heartening, although once he comes to class, he doesn't want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, all lectures are uploaded for free video on demand access. Then hard disks, we give institutions a hard disk of 120, 140 courses. All of it is given just at the cost of the hard disk. And streaming media access through the website, web contents as PDF downloads and so on. We've also sold individual DVD ROMs. The deployment issues, website accessible to students, e-contents through hard disks, as I said. Video lectures broadcast through Ekalavya channel, but that's again fixed timings. Video lectures on YouTube. YouTube came up and said we'll do this for you and there was some objection they said YouTube has bad material we said it anyway has bad material so let's add some <laughs> so, and uh, these are more website more thing you can see the number of US is 7.6 million a sizable fraction from the US and we get email from the US saying 
what my prof failed to explain in 15 lectures you were able to explain in three thank you very much and so on so there are very good teachers in india also so, here you have the virtual we are thinking of the virtual university the whole idea of the nptel program was to start a virtual university after we had 600 courses ready so you need a menu if you want to start a virtual university so we are now getting close to it we'll have 700 courses by june and hopefully 1000 courses by december in the virtual university will start we have also run pilot run of two open online courses not so massive not like coursera or edx which have 100000 students but there they have the technology perfected in india we are a peculiar country we have everything but we don't have anything on a given time and a given day <laughs> So you think you have all the connectivity and so on, then your power will go, your generator will fail. <laughs> so I think you can't risk 100,000 yet, but we will get there. Uh, for one thing, I mean, we do all the good things that the West does. We've also promised to do everything wrong that the West does within 10 years. So we'll do some of the wrong things as well. But in any case, we are running a pilot course now. Two courses are running for, with 1,000 students distributed over 10 institutions. They're different from Coursera and EDX in design. I'll explain how these are the courses. This is also on the website. First thing is, uh, these courses are live. These lectures are given and you listen to them in various colleges. The subject matter experts give the lectures, the quizzes and the solutions. The faculty mem mentors from partner institutions take care of operational details. They create discussion fora for students. That's not picking up yet. In the social media, the discussion fora seem to have picked up. But when it comes to the subject, students are still reluctant to discuss it. They don't realize that their ignorance is actually shared already with others. So they are afraid to expose it individually. But I think it's, it's a matter of time. You have to reply to questions and queries whenever possible. Evaluation is based on attendance, grades, assignments, tests, exams, participation and so on. You know, I have to say something about evaluation. In case you students think examinations are a bore, I assure you we faculty think it's a bigger bore. <laughs> Because you write one exam and go away, we have to grade all those papers. And at the end of it, have the depressed, really depressive feeling that we didn't teach anything. <laughs> so, so my strong recommendation is you grade on 50 plus x by 2. You give the student 50%. And then whatever they make out of 100, you divide by 2 and add to this 50. Then you can go away thinking you taught the class very well. Uh, it's different from Coursera, as I said. Currently not man so massive yet, but in India this is simply a matter of time. I mean we'll beat them hollow. The number of students we have is more than their population. So <laughs> <laughs> sooner or later we're going to beat them hollow. But I think we have to be careful. We have to go in steps to make sure that the technology works, everything falls in place and so on. And then uh, these are live lectures. We have partner institutions. I think this is very important. We have taken a conscious stand that we'll include other colleges in also offering the courses in the second phase. About uh, 5 to 10 percent of the courses in the second phase are actually offered by teachers from other colleges. We have good people everywhere. It's just that the number, the average quality of IITs is better. But on the other hand, you have good people in all institutions. And we must use them. And we need them all. And, uh, their, and participation will make them also you know, have an ownership in the program. We have a course completion certificate from IIT and grade card from the partner university. We are running two more courses in August and these the industry people will be involved. And uh, I'm, there is where I expect the numbers to go up very fast, especially the IT industry because they never take 10 or 20, they take thousands at any time. So I just want to make some concluding remarks. So thank you for listening. Thank you.